Så där, då uh, kör vi igång. Hej och välkomna allihopa. Uh, riktigt kul att ha så många med oss idag. Uh, ett ytterligare ett seminarium i vår serie om elektromobilitet. Och, uh, idag ska vi snacka om fordonsbatterier och cirkularitet och ett andra liv för, för just fordonsbatterier. Och med oss har vi Kåte Svar och Erik från MDU. Så det blir riktigt kul att höra vad de har att säga. Mycket intressant. Jag heter Kristoffer. Jag arbetar på MITC, Mellardalen Industrial Technology Center här i Eskilstuna. Och jag kommer att vara den som modererar och guidar er genom den här timmen. Ska vi se. Först har vi lite det praktiska grejer. Det här webbinariet kör vi genom ett projekt som heter Transmission som handlar om omställningen i fordonsindustrin. Där vi jobbar med ett långt tag, just elektrifiering av fordonsindustrin och så vidare. Vi har en massa avsnitt i serien som vi har spelat in redan och de går att se på, på vår hemsida. Så ni ser länken här på bilden. Så gå gärna in och kika där, de är superintressanta och riktigt bra att titta på. Viktigt här är att seminariet spelas in. Så är det någon som, som inte vill vara med i en inspelning, då får ni gärna lämna nu. Vi kommer klippa bort er så att ni kommer inte synas. Men har ni frågor och, och, och pratar så kommer det såklart spelas in. Då. Om det är någon som vill använda bildmaterialet från presentatörerna här i, i något sammanhang så, så fråga gärna presentörerna innan ni, ni delar det. Frågor. När det dyker upp, de tar vi gärna i chatten under själva presentationen. Så skriv in er fråga så kommer jag läsa upp den för presentatören sen. Eller så tar ni frågor när vi har frågestund. Det blir en stund i mitten och sen är det i slutet. Sen är det viktigt att ha kamera och mikrofon avstängd. Eftersom vi är väl runt säkert en hundra personer som är med. Och så har gärna kamera och mikrofon avstängd för att störa så lite som möjligt. Ja, idag då, vad ska vi snacka om? Ett andra liv för fordonsbatterier. Man räknar med att det kommer att ha sålts ungefär 27 miljoner fordon runt 2030. Och redan ganska snart så kommer det finnas 250 000 ton pensionerade fordonsbatterier. Och de här kommer ju ha ett värde fortfarande. De kanske inte kommer att funka i sin ursprungliga applikation, men det kommer ju att ha ett värde. Och hur ska det här fungera? Hur ska affärsmodellerna se ut? Och hur ska man designa batterier och så vidare för att det här ska funka på, på ett bra och cirkulärt sätt? Och det är det vi ska fördjupa oss i idag. Och till hjälp har vi med oss Kottersvar, professor på MDU, och Erik, också professor på MDU, som ska berätta lite om, om det de har jobbat med. Delar av presentationen kommer att vara på engelska, så jag hoppas ni har förståelse för det. Ja, jag vill lämna det över. I will, I will do this in English now, so we'll transition to into English and I will hand over to to uh, Kotteswar and Erik. So, thank you very much for joining us. It's going to be great to, to have you here and uh, the stage is yours. Welcome everyone. Um... As uh, Christopher mentioned, uh, I'm Kotesh Chimala, Associate Professor in Product and Production Development and uh, Project Leader for this Recreate project called Second Life Management of EV Batteries. Uh, both Eric and me uh, working in this project, uh, but we belong to different groups. Uh, I'm part of a digital and circular industrial service research group at uh, MDU Eskilstuna. Um, and Eric, uh, Professor in Eng Energy Engineering uh, part of Future Energy Research Group in uh, MDU Westros. Uh, today we uh, try to provide an overview of uh, results we came so far. Uh, we have been doing this project for the past two and a half years. Um, uh, we would like to highlight uh, what we found related to business models and how do you build ecosystems around the business model uh, for battery second life. Uh, what are the possible design principles you need to consider and uh, and uh, guidelines for performance monitoring uh, when you are into this business. A brief agenda, uh, I will start describe uh, about the Recreate project and what are our ambitions with this project. 
and uh, then straightly move towards um, results. Uh, what are the key challenges enablers we found in implementing business models? And we also develop a framework, uh, how to handle these uh, challenges and enablers uh, in your business. And then what are the possible circular business models uh, we found from, uh, from our studies? Uh, and then uh, design principles for the battery second life. And then Eric uh, will talk about uh, battery performance monitoring. Uh, we prepared uh, quite a lot of information. So hopefully we cover the agenda and we have some minutes for the taking interesting questions and discussion. Uh, battery second life applications, as you all know, growing a lot. Uh, there are different types of demonstrations and pilot projects going on. Uh, some of them or even uh, come to commercialization as well. Uh, basically, everything is connected to energy storage um, from different perspective. The applications include industrial, residential, grid related, uh, commercial and non-commercial applications. Uh, some uh, Most of the applications are on on-grid, but uh, there are also cases where you could make uh, use of uh, second life applications on off-grid as well. Um, as you see in these uh, 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 figures that uh, the second life applications are connected to solar farms and uh, wind farms, uh, hydropower plants, uh, public uh, charging stations, uh, and then also different types of recreation vehicles like uh, summer trailers. And uh, then there are some applications also seen in the mobile power use in remote and temporary applications uh, where uh, small vendors can use it for the business purpose. Um, and then you, many uh, companies now uh, moving towards uh, designing these batteries, uh, especially in cars. Uh, how can you make it more modular and then trying to reuse uh, uh, in a home, uh, in a very simple infrastructure? Uh, and then there are uh, in developing countries, there are several uh, uh, pilot uh, projects going on. How can you reuse these batteries, uh, uh, make electricity uh, and uh, for the region uh, without uh, having any grid support? Uh, however, the commercial implementation of these applications and uh, related research is uh, still lacking. Uh, so this is uh, exactly what we are trying to address with this uh, Recreate project uh, funded by Knowledge Foundation. Uh, the project idea is uh, very simple. Uh, there are different uh, types of uh, batteries used in uh, the vehicles, electric vehicles. Uh, after some time, uh, these batteries degrade over time. They lost 20 to 30 percent of capacity. Uh, but then uh, the batteries can be used in other applications, especially less demanding and stationary applications. Uh, how could we repair and refurbish, repurpose and remanufacture uh, these batteries so that we can create a new life or a second life uh, to these uh, batteries? So the project aim, how can we develop uh, efficient, economic, uh, feasible second life management solutions so that we can improve the Swedish manufacturing industry competitiveness. In especially uh, in our project, we focus on business models, uh, possible business model scenarios, and uh, what type of methods, processes, and capabilities that are needed uh, for a company to make this a uh, circular transition. And how could you define uh, design guidelines and principles from the beginning uh, to create a second life? So our project partner companies are uh, Volvo Construction Equipment uh, in collaboration with Volvo Group Circular Operations and Solutions, Alstom, uh, Mahler Energy, uh, Eskilstuna Strangness Energy Milieu, and uh, Capro. Uh, our research is guided by four questions. I just want to mention very quickly. Uh, first of all, what are the main barriers and enablers for second life management? Uh, and second, uh, what applications and business model concepts are economically feasible? Uh, third, uh, 
what are the key determinants for the success of using these batteries in second life applications? And then finally, uh, how can we develop related methods and processes uh, in the battery value chain so that we can uh, implement these uh, second life application solutions? Uh, the project uh, structured in uh, six work packages, uh, but uh, in this uh, presentation, we will focus on uh, three of them. Uh, start with uh, the mapping of barriers and opportunities, uh, different types of methods and processes we have developed, uh, and then uh, the design guidelines work we have uh, worked through. Uh, one of the first outcome we uh, uh, found uh, came uh, in the project is uh, key barriers in implementing uh, battery second life business model. We have done uh, uh, around uh, 20 interviews with 16 companies in the battery value chain, and uh, and we have done several workshops with our recruit project partners, um, and then identified around uh, 150 challenges and which of them uh, clustered into these nine uh, main types of uh, barriers. Uh, this, of course, will affect the the way you create a value, the way you deliver the value, and the way you uh, capture the value uh, in, in related to the business model. Uh, the first one is related to organizational maturity. Um, we found um, many companies uh, lack of competence, business model knowledge, and uh, how can we address uh, the second life applications. And there are also the tendency of reluctance for change uh, towards a circular economy. So the organizational immaturity uh, comes as a highest barrier uh, when it comes to second life business model. And the second, uh, battery quality. There is still a lot of uncertainty. The, uh, identify the state of health, the remaining useful life, uh, what is the possible performance we can get, and how is the physical conditions and uh, the chemistry and so on. So the second barrier is uh, related to battery quality. Uh, the third one, uh, how can we make uh, the, the business opportunities, the commercial feasibility? Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty related to future prices. These new technologies are coming in. Uh, how the market uh, evolves and how can we uh, how the market accept the second life uh, products uh, in terms of requirements and uh, the certification and so on. So the commercial feasibility and the business uncertainty is the third barrier we found. The fourth one uh, related to partnerships and responsibility. There is a still uh, lack of understanding uh, the ownership and what kind of uh, roles and responsibilities you need to have uh, in the collaboration. What are the guarantees and warranties you can provide on these applications? Uh, fifth one uh, related to battery variants and technology. Uh, all, there are different types of battery uh, available with the different chemistries and sizes and uh, still new technologies are em emerging. So how could you make a standard around it? How can we handle uh, such uh, variant types of uh, these batteries uh, comes into the, uh, this category? The sixth one uh, related to handling and logistics. Uh, how do we store the batteries and how can we monitor and uh, uh, make a smoother transportation uh, with the, to different uh, locations? Um, and then the seventh one, uh, cost effectiveness. How do we make sure that uh, uh, the uh, the cost is uh, efficient compared to the new batteries and what kind of investment we should uh, uh, place on to make uh, re remanufacturing, repurposing, and uh, recycling? So it's a lot of uh, um, questions around the cost, uh, why this is better compared than other solutions. Uh, the uh, eighth one related to battery volumes. Uh, still, uh, even though the estimate shows that we should have a lot of batteries, retired batteries now, uh, but still uh, the lack of volume, there are a lot of batteries are exiting the ecosystem. Um, so it's not really the, the projected estimations uh, we, we see yet. So the battery volume is uh, still a challenge. 
Uh, and then the last one related to policies and legislation. There is a lack of uh, understanding and ambiguity of the regulations. How could be interpreted related to our business and uh, what it means for us? Uh, so this uh, uh, a lot of challenges related to the policies and legislation. Although these barriers are overwhelming, uh, we also found uh, several key enablers that could support the implementation of a uh, battery second life business model. Uh, the first is uh, identify the partners and uh, make a partnerships and uh, build ecosystems uh, with a common interest and uh, trying to work with the new approaches uh, around this uh, battery second life. The second one is related to standardization. Uh, how do we make sure that uh, different types of batteries to be standard and uh, platform standards and design standards and infrastructure standards uh, when it comes to the charging and so on? So standardization uh, be uh, becomes the important key enabler. Uh, the third one uh, related to regulation and external support. Um, how? Uh, how can we support the companies that are moving in this uh, circular economy direction? Uh, what kind of incentives and uh, policies they need to have in place? Uh, the fourth key enabler is a competitive cost and benefit, uh, which belongs to how could we reduce the cost uh, when working with a second life? Uh, how can we gain more competitive advantage compared than the part uh, other competitors? Um, and also related to the competence investments and the, the, the pricing of these. Uh, so basically covering the, the cost and the benefits you need to identify, uh, which is uh, the key enabler. Uh, the fifth one related to capabilities and resources, uh, which uh, include expertise, resources, uh, holistic understanding, and how could you use the digitalization as a uh, digital technologies as a, a key part of the business model. And then the sixth one, uh, innovative applications. Uh, uh, how companies together come with a new business model, new scenarios, and uh, with completely outside of the box thinking, come up with the different types of demonstration projects. So this innovation, innovative approach is becomes uh, important, a key enabler. And then finally, the, the supply chain structure. How could we set up a proper logistic flow, uh, which could be make a smoother transition from the first life to the second life, and then to the recycling. Uh, and considering all these retired battery volumes, uh, they need to be uh, kind of uh, integrated to this uh, take back systems uh, throughout the Europe. So the supply chain structure is uh, also another important key enabler. Uh, once we found all the uh, these nine uh, key barriers and challenges, then we, uh, how can we support companies uh, overcome uh, all these critical challenges enabler? We need some kind of prioritization uh, to work in the business. So then we came up with uh, two dimensions. Uh, one is the time dimension, uh, the what you need to prioritize in terms of uh, short term and long term. Uh, and then the second dimension is uh, responsibility, uh, whether it belongs to uh, the individual firm or whether it belongs to the ecosystem uh, where you need to work with the different companies uh, together. So this leads to four quadrants, as you see in this image. Uh, and then we done uh, several workshops um, with the partner companies. Okay, how do you see the challenges? Uh, which of them comes more short term related to your firm level, uh, which of them comes to ecosystem level and uh, and then the long term as well. Uh, so the finally, when we mapped uh, all the, the barriers and enablers on these four quadrants, uh, then we uh, see this as outcome. Uh, when we reflected more and more on each quadrant, uh, uh, for example, firm related and short term uh, where they need to address the immaturity of the organization and handling logistics, the capabilities and resources they need to have in place 
and how it is a competitive advantage uh, 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 for an individual company. And then when it, when it comes to ecosystem related and short term, then uh, we found the challenges related to partnerships and responsibilities, what kind of policies we have and how it's, uh, what kind of investment we need to make in terms of cost and who owns uh, what in, in, in terms of these investments. How could we make ecosystem collaborations and the standardization and regulation and support? So all falls in this. Uh, you need to work with a different set of actors uh, in a short term. And then when it comes to long term, uh, we see quite few, but still it's they're a bit challenging uh, to address uh, uh, firm related and long term. Uh, what kind of battery variants are coming in, how the technology is changing. Um, innovative applications and supply chain structure. And then uh, long term ecosystem related, we, uh, we found uh, second life battery quality and the battery value. Uh, interestingly, uh, many companies uh, uh, in the consortium mentioned uh, the commercial feasibility and the business uncertainty that should be in the middle. Uh, so you need to come back both in short term and long term. Uh, uh, and both the firm level and ecosystem level. And then we made a further analysis, okay, uh, how we can still uh, guide the companies, navigate them uh, in terms of addressing these uh, challenges and enablers. Then we see the first quadrant, uh, uh, um, companies need to make a strategic initial, initial steps. Uh, they need to define some activities uh, to move in this direction, uh, which we call firm level initiation. So individual company decide, oh, we go towards the second life operations and it's a firm level initiation. Um, and then the second part, uh, short term and ecosystem related, refer to the activities where you try to map up your uh, stakeholders and try to form appropriate ecosystem for battery second life operations. And then you together systematically work uh, towards uh, uh, making this business possible. Uh, we call all these activities related to ecosystem construction. And then uh, third one uh, referred to the activities where you realize, oh, we part of the ecosystem, but uh, maybe in the long term, we need to reconfigure uh, uh, and optimize our readiness towards these uh, business models. Um, all these activities uh, which you change or prepare yourself at the firm level in the long term, we call firm level optimization. And then finally, the, the last quadrant, uh, ecosystem related and long term, uh, refer to the activities where you try to manage and uh, orchestrate the partnerships and collaboration uh, for a long term viability uh, in terms of second life operations. So these uh, um, film level initiation, then you construct ecosystem, film level optimization and ecosystem orchestration becomes the uh, key configurations uh, according to our analysis. And then we uh, based on uh, 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 discussion with companies, okay, how different companies can take a pathways around this uh, because every individual company can be very different, depends on the business and uh, where they are in terms of uh, value chain. Um, so we uh, found um, uh, three patterns here. Uh, film can start at uh, uh, individually at the film level. Oh, now we make a, a strategy towards a second life and the circularity. So, um, and then you move towards uh, building ecosystem, uh, trying to coordinate with the different partners and uh, uh, and then you form ecosystem. And then you realize that uh, maybe we need to optimize uh, um, at firm level. We need to work on our own strategy and build uh, capabilities and resources in a long-term perspective. Then you, come to film level optimization. And then uh, finally, you um, prepare for the long term uh, uh, business, uh, establishing the second life business model where you become a part of the ecosystem orchestration. So this is one uh, 
pathway companies can make uh, towards a second life operation. And then we also see the other two types um, where uh, the firm can start it uh, uh, individually and then you form ecosystem. And then uh, this company might have a higher maturity. Uh, you don't need to go back to firm level, uh, but you continue to orchestrate for part of that ecosystem and orchestrate and then you come to film level optimization. Uh, that's the second configuration pathway uh, we see that is possible. And then we also see that uh, a few companies are already part of the ecosystem somehow in the second life, maybe without realizing that uh, they need to have a different strategy uh, when it comes to second life and circular tr uh, transition. Uh, then uh, what you can do uh, in this case is you maybe comes back to film level initiation and trying to reflect on oh uh, how can we set up more systematic uh, strategic change inside the organization uh, and then you follow the same path as described uh, previously uh, the second uh, possibility is also similar you you come back but then you kind of follow up the the configuration pathway and depends on the maturity and how long you are part of this uh, ecosystem. Then you can also maybe move directly to orchestration and uh, firm level. Uh, the other one is uh, to the, you work a lot, uh, uh, both short term, long term at a firm level, and then you move to ecosystem. So these are uh, some of the, uh, the guidelines we have prepared. Uh, uh, help the companies to make a transition towards the second life operations. Uh, then uh, the second part of uh, the presentation, uh, the look into different types of possible business model. So we start uh, looking into theory, what are the business models available? Uh, one is a slowing resource loop where you use the product longer. Uh, and the second one is the closing resource loop uh, where you trying to reuse the products again um, after the end of life and uh, uh, make it as a circular uh, flow of resources. And then the third strategy is a narrowing resource loop uh, where you try to uh, reduce resources uh, related to the product use. Um, for example, design for multiple functions and uh, maximize the use capacities, more narrowing the resource loop. And then the final uh, fourth one is the regenerating res uh, resource loop, um, where you try to make sure that you use uh, renewable resources um, uh, from the first place, means uh, you take uh, more circular material already in the production and uh, and trying to use them throughout the product life cycle. Um, and then uh, you use renewable sources like renewable energy and electricity uh, when the product is in use. So this more uh, make sure that you make uh, clean from the uh, beginning itself uh, called regenerating resource loop. So this uh, taking this inspiration from the theory, uh, we look into what are the current business model available and what would be the upcoming business models in this area? And how can they make a transition from the current to upcoming uh, business model? Current uh, business models uh, that you offer, we, we found more linear. Uh, you offer the product and then you make a different types of services around the product and you provide the maintenance and support and then the R&D and the consultancy services. But what we see uh, from the data with a discussion with companies, the upcoming business models have uh, three types, three categories. Uh, one is the extending business model where you try to extend the product life as much as you can. Um, the second one is the looping business model where to trying to reuse the batteries for different applications and uh, keep the battery in the loop uh, for different purposes. Um, and then the third one is the sharing business model, uh, where you try to come up with the different types of contracts, uh, uh, leasing and performance oriented and availability contracts and, uh, and et cetera. 
And then how to move from current business model to uh, upcoming business model. Then you need to work through value creation, uh, especially the second life. What is the second life value proposition? Uh, and uh, value delivery, uh, what kind of network we should develop in order to deliver um, the upcoming business model? And what is the revenue business model around the second life? And then most importantly, how digital technologies can be used uh, both for value creation uh, and delivery and value capture. So which becomes uh, preconditions. Uh, if you work on these um, uh, aspects, then it's uh, you get a smoother transition from as is and to, to be a business model. Uh, here's some more information about uh, what we found uh, based on our analysis. In extending a uh, business model, uh, as I mentioned, a lot about product life extension uh, through maintenance and repair, and you upgrade, you know, refurbish um, uh, the batteries and uh, extend the uh, product life. And uh, you also use the remanufacturing as uh, another strategy where you're trying to include remanufacturing products and uh, parts and components uh, into the business model. Uh, sharing business model, product lease, availability contract, collaborative consumption and sharing platforms, and then uh, performance-based contracts where you try to uh, provide a battery as a service for a particular performance. Um, uh, and then the last one is the gap exploiter model uh, where you try to see the gaps in the value creation process and trying to support the customer. Uh, with the proper business model. Uh, one example of gap exploit model is uh, uh, now many companies exploring providing the charging infrastructure uh, at the customer side uh, that uh, where you're trying to capitalize and uh, support the customer uh, in this direction. And then we see the third type looping business model, a lot about uh, repurposing, recycling, um, and then circular supplies also uh, where you make sure that you get a proper material uh, in the first place, which could later uh, be used for second life and recycling. So uh, circular supplies is also another uh, important looping business model. And then energy recovery, um, how do you reuse the energy uh, that uh, you used in the, the production and the product use? Uh, so that you looping the energy uh, uh, in the in the product life cycle. That is another important business model. Uh, and then the last one, efficient buildings and sustainable product locations, where you try to provide uh, appropriate energy infrastructure uh, related to um, closer to the customer sites. Um, which is uh, kind of a, a bit of equal to gap, gap exploiter model, where you try to provide uh, some kind of uh, energy infrastructure. And then uh, what we see uh, as a pattern in this uh, business model, there are different types of variants uh, through which uh, companies are planning to offer. Um, the first one is a very closed uh, form. Uh, where you're trying to do everything by yourself. And uh, um, this is especially the, the possible scenario when you're new, new to this business and when a lot of things are uh, unclear, where everything becomes uh, very closed and you uh, make a business model um, in, in this uh, closed structure. And then we see the other type as a more semi-open, uh, where you open for collaboration and you um, you bring different actors, uh, some startups and uh, small SMEs uh, into the business model, but it has a restriction. Uh, so you keep them to some extent, uh, but not like very open collaboration. The third type is the uh, open collaboration where you uh, really agree on and consensus, you share mutual resources and competence and expertise. Um, and then finally, the uh, the higher level in the open uh, structure is the joint venture, where from the beginning you 
make a collaboration and you work together to establish this uh, looping business model. Uh, and I also uh, want to bring up this um, inspiration from Rolls Royce. What would be the possible scenario uh, around the uh, vehicle batteries? Uh, Rolls Royce established this uh, power by the hour or pay for flying hours uh, 15 years ago, and then they're gradually increasing how they uh, lease the aircraft engine uh, for their customers and offering different types of remote uh, remote uh, uh, services. And now they make uh, this uh, total care offer like, like a online store where you could actually purchase uh, different types of services. Uh, we could see uh, something similar could be also uh, possible and uh, going to come and many companies going to work on that, uh, offer a complete care lifecycle solutions around the batteries, uh, where you try to extend the value on the battery with the, uh, with the different types of uh, services and, uh, and then make it more uh, complete care lifecycle solutions, uh, similar to Rolls-Royce to some extent. Uh, and this uh, another way to interpret is uh, uh, the, from the pure product, uh, the, how the traditional business model where the batteries, uh, you sell the battery uh, with the machine and then you offer some kind of warranties uh, in collaboration with the third party providers. But then um, the next phase is more like you, you own the battery, you have a dedicated service centers and dismantlers. Uh, you offer leasing programs and upgrading, swapping, uh, and storage uh, uh, as a service. So there are a lot of applications could be possible here. Large energy storage systems, you integrate with solar, wind, and hydro, charging stations, EV conversions, and uh, support uh, V2G, vehicle to grid, and, and vice versa. And then finally, the more towards a pure service where you offer complete battery care lifecycle uh, portfolio. Uh, here, um, similar to the previous slide from the Rolls Royce, you offer the lifecycle care on around the battery and around the battery infrastructure uh, and make a complete network around that, including the, the battery passport. Uh, so this uh, is only possible when you go towards more joint ventures uh, and uh, where it provide a, a, a good inno innovation space where you can work on, come up with a completely new ideas uh, 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 to be complete in the market. Uh, and this is the uh, how a closed one and the open one can be changed. A very quick illustration. Um, uh, where OEM uh, in heavy duty vehicle industry, um, you lease the, the vehicle to the dealers and then the dealer offer to the customer. Um, and then when the battery is retired, uh, the, the dealer gets in and then this OEM has their own remanufacturer. Um, they have more remanufacturing facilities. Uh, then either you remanufacture the battery by yourself and then offer to the customer through the dealer. Uh, that is one possible business model. Um, if the battery uh, uh, may be used for other purposes, uh, like a repurposing, uh, then it goes to uh, repurpose. And this is also OEM can uh, do by themselves. Um, and then uh, it's lead to a new customer. Uh, and this new customer also could be OEM in this one, since they want to reuse the batteries in their group. Um, so it's uh, uh, this one uh, good example how the batteries can be looped itself uh, within the same organization when it comes to the large uh, uh, manufacturing company. Uh, this another example where when you are open, um, this it's get uh, more complex and uh, with a lot of different flows. Uh, for example, here, a uh, bus company, uh, a city municipality and the regional energy firm, and they try to work on energy storage as a service. And uh, then as you see that it get uh, uh, highly complex, but uh, this um, could be a win-win-win situation, uh, which I will be talking about now. 
Uh, often in the business scenario, uh, we talk about win-win situation uh, where uh, individual company talks about, okay, what is win for me and what is the win for the stakeholders? Uh, but uh, what we found um, uh, in this study, we also got a best uh, award for the, this paper. Um, the environment and the society need to be part of the uh, uh, as a key stakeholder uh, in in this analysis. Because if you only take as a, a business and a cost perspective, uh, and then we miss the another important aspects on the. Uh, in the sustainability, the ecological and uh, and the societal dimension. So we uh, propose this uh, multi-stakeholder framework um, where from the beginning you try to make a win-win-win uh, business scenarios where the third win is uh, related to is these solutions are um, good enough for the society and good enough for the environment so you could uh, very early stage, you can compare uh, different available solutions and uh, make uh, uh, kind of some kind of matrix uh, uh, goes for win-win and win-win-win situations. So this methodology is available. Uh, it's a kind of inspired from the design thinking methodology where you work with the different stakeholders very, very early phase, like a fuzzy front end uh, in the innovation map win-win-win uh, business scenarios. Uh, to conclude this, uh, what we see in the business models, the traditional business model categorized into value propositions and uh, where there are different dimensions covered, and then the value creation also different dimensions covered and, and so on. But you need to include this uh, third win, uh, which I talk about uh, now, the society and environment. It's not only the value for the customer, uh, not only value for the stakeholder, but you need to consider uh, what the kind of uh, value this solution, uh, uh, this uh, business model is offering towards the society and toward the environment. Uh, similar here in the value capture, where you include uh, the environmental impact, uh, environmental footprint uh, 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 as a third dimension in identify the possible business models. Uh, and then we also see um, this change uh, towards a circular economy um, uh, business models at second life. Uh, if one single organization in the company uh, plan a change, this is not enough. You need to have a cross-functional readiness in the company. Um, uh, for example, you need to work with the design and product development and uh, company's uh, internal capabilities and culture. Uh, then you need to third level, you need to work with the customer and business model. And the fourth layer, you need to work with ecosystem. So all this cross-functionally need to make a change at the same time. Uh, so we made a map, um, a kind of multi-readiness uh, framework where uh, different levels of readiness can be done in different stages. Uh, so that uh, level three, where you reach higher maturity in all the levels, both internally with the customer and also uh, with the ecosystem. So uh, it's uh, important to rethink the way you organize the work in different levels. Uh, and then the final part, we also looked into design principles and guidelines for the battery uh, second life. Uh, we reviewed the literature, there are a lot of literature available, uh, not on the batteries, but on the eco design and uh, product service system design. Uh, so we take these uh, guidelines that are available uh, from the literature, and then we done a workshop uh, with one of our partner company. Uh, so we classified them. Uh, there's quite a long list. We classified them into uh, 20 types, and then we asked them to score based on their relevance related to this uh, uh, extending and sharing, looping and regenerating business models. And based on this score, um, we identify the top 11 design principles uh, that are uh, very critical for the battery second life. 
Uh, the first one, design with non-toxic materials and avoid mixed materials. Uh, the second design guideline, design for circular supplies, uh, design for the entire value chain, design for circular behavior, and uh, design for upgrading and updating and adaptability, uh, design for modularity, design for repurposing, uh, design for traceability, design for easy use of digitalization and IT. Um, and the remaining two ones are also related to digitalization, uh, like a big data analysis and cloud computing. So we see the these 11 top design principles are very interconnected and they enabling each other, uh, they're supporting each other. So maybe in the end there will be uh, a three main categories. So one is uh, design for modularity and platforms. Um, the other one is the design for traceability. Uh, and then the third uh, related to the value chain, design for the value chain. So these uh, uh, we're still working on this uh, and uh, currently a master thesis work going on uh, related to this work. Yeah, now I hand over to Eric. Yes, thank you very much, Koteshwar. And I will start talking more about uh, what should we use these second life batteries for? And Eric, what Eric, are... Eric, I'm, I'm sorry here. I, we, we got a, a couple of questions that came in here uh, for, uh, during Kotos for us uh, talk. So let's, let's cover them before you go on. Okay. So we don't forget them. So I have from, from Patrice question here. When you say battery, what level of the battery are you considering? Yeah. Is it a big difference working on a pack level versus working on a module module level? But that's why. Yeah. What uh, are we are we talking about the the whole thing that goes into the vehicle, or are we talking down on on the pack or module or? Yeah, uh, at least in our analysis, we considering at the pack level. Uh, from the vehicle at the pack level. Uh, so, yeah, that's the level we consider uh, uh, in, into the business model. Of course, in some of the business model, um, you need to go more into this uh, detailed cell level as well, like uh, when it comes to recycling and uh, especially the closing business model. Uh, you need to go down uh, to the module and cell level. Uh, but when we are discussing and uh, in a higher level, we consider the uh, battery pack level uh, as a starting point. Mm. Uh, could I ask clarify the question a little bit? Uh, I think the challenge is this is not AAA batteries. You can't take it from one torch and put it into another torch and believe that it works. If you are on pack level, you need to communicate with it. You need the BMS. You as the OEM need to be very much involved for anyone else to be able to use it. So. How do you see this? Because it's not just to put in the battery and hope that it works. No. Yeah, uh, th that is exactly what we see in our analysis. Uh, 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 the OEM has a higher responsibility, and then uh, uh, how there are different uh, things you need to be in consider. Uh, Perhaps I should break in there because I will cover a number of those type of things in my presentation. Yeah. And if we are just proceeding here, I will not have a chance to say anything. <laughs> yeah. Can we proceed with this and then take the questions, the rest? So because it's already, it's only 10 minutes left. Okay, let's do that. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. No, so what we can see here is that uh, what we are looking for is how can we uh, see what is the status of the batteries and we are talking about we are starting with looking at cells we are going from cells to modules and from modules to packs so we are trying to cover and utilize information from the cell level up to the module and the uh, and the package levels so we try to integrate those uh, from the perspective of doing this performance monitoring and then when it comes to the applications we can look for here uh, in sweden we are having four regions and we have to balance the power all the time. Every second you have to have a, a balance between production and uh, consumption. And what we're looking for is a new situation where we'll have very much more wind power and solar power in the system, but also huge new demand in the top of the uh, northern part of Sweden. So what we've been looking at is how can we balance in this case region number three, which is 
Stockholm, Gothenburg, and in between there. Can you take next picture? Kontrar. Here we can see uh, in this region how is the variation of production uh, that is above uh, the, the zero level we have uh, the production. We can see it's nuclear power, hydropower, it's uh, wind power and so on. And the variation is primarily in the wind power uh, very much. It's the, the light blue the curves. At the bottom we can see what is the consumption and this is during one month, January in 2022. And then we have been scaling and looking for how much, much is, uh, if we see the production average, we have roughly 1,070 megawatt as average production in this region. And then we can see how long does it take to go from one position where we are below average up to when we're crossing over to where we're above. Uh, and then we can integrate and see how many kilowatt hours or megawatt hours have we utilized that are below the average and above the average. And here to the right, you can see uh, the toughest time was once in January. Then we had 130 hours and a total of 100 gigawatt hours. And uh, that is quite a lot. We can uh, go to the next picture. And here we can see a bit if we take just during a week, how it varies. The orange we can see here is where is a lack of power uh, from this balance for wind and solar totally. The yellow is uh, what is surplus when we can charge the batteries again here. And then to looking for how much do we really need? How many gigawatt hours? Uh, if we just take, as I showed the previous picture, it would be 100 gigawatt hours. But if we take the just uh, take not the average 1070, but half the average and say that, OK, we should cover everything that is below that level. Then we have the, the red uh, curve and then we are talking about perhaps not 100 gigawatt hours, but five to 10 gigawatt hours. And that is where we can see this is where it would be very interesting to, to store um, in batteries for shorter time periods, uh, the, the longer ones we are taking with the hydropower and we're having uh, with uh, other means like CHP, uh, combined heat and power production and so on also. Uh, so we have, this is a bit longer time perspective. We also have frequency control, which is coming up very much, but that we're talking about seconds and minutes uh, more, which is then not the kilowatt hours, but more the kilowatts. Next picture. Uh, we just look at what we want to do is to follow the deterioration of the batteries. And to do that, what we are doing is uh, using something called electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, uh, where we're taking starting with new batteries, new single cells and modules, and then we're running such a spectrum. Uh, and by doing this, we can follow and try to utilize the data from the single cells and some in series and so on um, and then keeping track on uh, what is happening when we are running a number of cycles with a different depth and also the the different so-called c rate if we have a one kilowatt hour battery and run it charge it in one hour then its c rate is one if it's in half an hour, it's C rate two. If it's two hours, it's C rate 0.5. This how fast and how heavy we are, we are using this. And then we are looking for with the uh, these uh, looking for different cycles, number of cycles, and different different depth. And from this, we are trying to predict uh, the remaining useful life rule uh, here. And uh, we are combining our own experiments with what we are finding in literature. Next picture. Uh, this is just showing a bit how it looks like when we are doing the experiments, but I think we take the next picture straight away. Here we can see if we are plotting uh, the measurements we have here, uh, you can uh, do something called a Nyquist plot. And uh, there you have the imaginary part of the impedance to, uh, towards the real part of the impedance. And there we can see we have correlations. So. If you look at to the right, you have a, a cell with an anode to the right and a cathode to the left. And then we have the lithium ions. And what we're having is some different uh, things in the cell happening here. We have a resistance that is due to uh, the solution resistance. 
So if we have a long distance between uh, the, the anode and cathode, it will be a huge or high resistance. If we have a small distance, a low. We have the variable impedance uh, due to diffusion of ions. So there will be some kind of a friction, you could say, of the ions. Uh, we have a charge transfer or polarization resistance close to the surface of the, especially the cathode, and double layer capacitance. We also get in creating building up on the way there when the ions are trying to get in. And those you can see from the curve here. So uh, you have RB, the, the bulk resistance in the beginning. Then we have this uh, charge transfer resistance, and then the CDL, AA capacitance and uh, diffusion. Next picture. And from this, you can also build up uh, doing something called um, electric circuit uh, model, uh, where we can have those different type of aspects and looking at the curves, and then we can uh, do a number of those in series if we have a, um, uh, several cells in series, we are building up uh, <laughs> these type of, of systems where you can analyze also uh, like modules and so on. Next picture. And this is what, what it looks like when we are doing experiments. We're having a number of batteries and we are cycling them uh, from low, <laughs> low voltage to high voltage and uh, with different type of C rates and all those type of things. And also we are looking at the temperature there. Next picture. From this, we're doing then data analysis. We're measuring the current voltage and, uh, and uh, temperature and uh, the information we can get both from the cells and so on, but also from the cell packs. Uh, so we have the cooperation with like Epiroc and we have with uh, Alstom and uh, Northvolt uh, on uh, these type of things. Where we are then looking at, we're doing experiments ourselves on the cell level. Uh, single cells and a bit larger cells in series, and then we're having full packs together with the other companies. Uh, what you can see here is that degradation is uh, like lithium ions can starting, um, they are reducing, and then you get metal, and uh, this can cause that you get aggregates in the bulk, which is causing then a resistance, so RB is then increasing. We can also get sintering if you have a high charge close to being 100% charged, your long-term sintering and clogging the pores, and then it will affect the RCT and the CDL here. Uh, the diffusion uh, limited here, the, the W you saw here, uh, cold temperature and hot temperature will affect this quite a lot. Uh, low temperature, more uh, online, so to say, and hot, uh, hot temperature due to risk for uh, sintering and uh, clogging and so on. And by following these factors, uh, how they are changing by time, so then we can do this prediction of uh, re remaining useful life. And how could we use those batteries uh, later on, both for these more short-term, uh, intense things like frequency uh, control, or the more long-term storaging uh, like I was talking about here, to balance uh, the wind power variations and uh, things like that. So from this, uh, then Kotteschwar can do signing of the agreements, uh, 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 how you can use this in, in different type of agreements and so on. I think that was the last picture. Yep. Yes. Uh, so, you, uh, per, sh sh shall we take the questions now, yeah. perhaps? Then, yeah, so. I think the, just want to clarify what uh, uh, related to previous question. I think we we have different types of uh, company uh, uh, companies in the consortium. So some of them we consider all the levels from the cell to the battery pack, and then some of the partners uh, they only interest on in the battery pack level. So there, it's a mixed uh, kind of analysis. Uh, depends on what are their business interest. Um, so all these business models that covers from the cell to pack levels. Just want to clarify that. Yeah. There were more questions, Christopher. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's uh, some more here in the chat. There's a uh, back to the business model. It's relating to, to I think the picture where you, you showed the OEM. 
in the center there. If the vehicle OEMs should own the batteries, the balance sheet will explode, as you proposed in the business model part of the presentation. What is, what is your thoughts about this? Yeah, I think uh, this uh, the closed business model. Uh, at least the OEM is the center. They uh, then these OEMs has a different business. Uh, um, areas and uh, then uh, they can see how to reuse the batteries for different purposes within their own group. Um, but then uh, what we reflected on, uh, maybe in the long run, uh, this would not be the case. And uh, in the beginning, you're maybe more cautious and trying to uh, see what are the possible opportunities. But um, in future, it's uh, more towards the joint ventures and joint collaborations uh, together with other uh, companies. Uh, so at least that's uh, uh, now maybe you think of more as a closed, but then I think you move more towards a semi-open uh, and uh, open uh, kind of business models. I hope that was a good answer for you, Patrice. I hope it's Patrice. Uh, we have you on, has a lot of questions. So you on, uh, feel free to, to ask your questions here. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. I was trying to type questions because you should type it, but it's a little bit long. Um, but I'm thinking about several things here. Uh, if you have, if you have very, I'm quite new. It's very interesting. I'm a little bit new to the batteries, so um, maybe uh, some questions are stupid here. But if you have more complex exosystems, it means that you have a higher need for standards. And you have also said that standardization is one of the, the key enablers here. But in your strategy slides, it seems that you, you never start with it. You start all the strategies with the short term. And in in my opinion, and the experience that we have for a lot of other sectors like mobile phones, etc., is that you should start with standardization mm. and define uh, not only standards, but to be, be sure that you have started to define an ecosystem and the correct interface to standardize. Yeah, uh, what we see the the standardization, uh, you uh, individual company maybe uh, not able to work on the standardization. You need to collaborate uh, with the different uh, partner companies. Like you need to take that discussion in the ecosystem setup. So that's why it's a short term. Uh, it's a very important in short term as an enabler, but then it need to be addressed in. A, a, in collaboration with other partner companies in that consortium, uh, uh, which you try to set up rather than individual company. Of course, you, when you initiate a new business, you need to work internally. What is your uh, strategy towards the standards and how it fit to your business? Uh, but uh, uh, the real uh, the solution uh, when you take this into the ecosystem uh, collaboration. So that that at least that's what we found from our discussion. So okay, that, but, but then to me it seems that one of the first steps you should do, even if you are a small actor, is to try to set up this international cooperation and to approach uh, similar firms in other countries, uh, approach standardizations organizations, etc., to, to start to get going, because th there are many fallbacks in trying to implement new IT-based systems um, nationally that can be very incompatible later on if you start with implementation and do standardization later. Yeah, the the, the first two quadrants in that it's not an implementation, it's a still like a development. So when you if you could map the, the first two and the bottom two, and then the first one is more you develop the firm readiness and ecosystem, and then the second below uh, below two quadrants are more related to the implementation. So I agree um, uh, the standardization uh, may be something that comes in the first, but uh, we, we communicate the same in that picture, but uh, maybe it's uh, um, kind of comes into the ecosystem, but uh, um, it, it's, uh, it's a bit tricky to map all this, but uh, what we found out uh, it's especially the high relevance in that uh, it's a boundary we what we want to communicate in that uh, model it's not like uh, we can't put a dot in somewhere okay this is you should do uh, in, in this particular phase but it's more like uh, okay in this um, 
time zone, uh, you should work on this. So from that perspective, uh, uh, the short term, both firms and ecosystem, they need to be integrated. Uh, but it also depends on different uh, uh, companies' context. Uh, at least in our recruit company, so we see that uh, it's a part of the ecosystem. Uh, you need to work together uh, in order to make a more feasible and viable solution for a long term. Um, we, we can say, we can say that what we're trying to do is look for what are the possible alternatives. And what could be the benefits and disadvantages with the different alternatives? And then different partners in this will have different inputs. They are having different conditions and so on. So it's more to give some kind of a guidelines. How can you think and what could you use? Uh, and then standardization and so on will probably come, but it's uh, not everyone has settled exactly what how they want to work yet. <laughs> So, okay, uh, it, it will come a bit, I think, a bit later. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. I see that we are out of time now, so maybe I should not uh, prolong this discussion here. But I, I, it would be interesting to discuss with some of you after the meeting uh, a little yeah, bit more yeah. about this. But mm -hmm. what we do know from some other sectors, for instance, like mobile phones or railways or uh, electronic fee collection, etc., is that uh, you, you, it's it's really a fallback to to do uh, implement uh, to wait with standardization. You should start with it at once uh, to at least make sure that you do 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 your implementation and design everything within an ecosystem or a system architecture that makes sense from uh, um, an open use perspective later on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I can stop presenting and then I can see. Oh, you are muted, Christopher. Christopher, you are muted. You're muted. We can't hear you. No, no. Okay. Sorry, guys. That was me poor moderating. Yo, so we have a, a question about from Peter here about how about mechanical stress? I think this question relates to your testing of uh, the battery cells that you talked about, Eric. Yes. Uh, honestly, we haven't been looking too much on the, on the mechanical stress. It has been a lot about the uh, the, the the mechanical stress from the perspective that you have a poor contact <laughs> uh, that is included uh, in it uh, when it comes to more mechanical stress from the perspective of uh, you, you could get leakage and things like that we have in other products uh, we're working together with uh, LKAB on mining vehicles and uh, mining and the risks and things around that so we have Program, uh, projects on that side, uh, but it's not in this recreate. It's more from <laughs> fresh batteries uh, yeah. and what can happen there. And another question from Peter is: It's more specific. How is MDU or are MDU doing any studies on the Mälar and the battery storage located in the Rocklunda area? Yes, we are. We are participating in that and. There has been some uh, issues around the, uh, or some, the, the batteries were very early, so uh, there have been some technical problems, uh, but we are participating in that in the valuation, yes. Can we see these questions later on, Christopher? Sure, they are in the chat, so it's possible to... Uh... To download it, I guess. Uh, so we're running a late of, uh, or we're running over the deadline or the time here. So it's ten past twelve. So thank you everyone that participated in this uh, in the webinar. And uh, I don't know, do you, Kotaswal and Eric, do you have time? Because if you have time, we could stay for for perhaps five or ten minutes more. If there are more specific questions and discussions to be held. Uh, if you have time and, and the participants yeah, have some time, then let's continue because uh, these uh, discussions and the questions are, are the the, mo uh, the the most interesting parts about these usually. So so mm. if everyone is okay, let's continue. Uh, uh, my question: do, do you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. My question was that uh, I was on the university in Uppsala, and then we were talking about the stress. Uh, of the battery when they have uh, the chain when, when you load the battery 
you have have a volume change of, of the system uh, for roughly 10% when you have a lithium ion. And this they mean gets a, 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 a mechanical stress and cracks in the battery. And therefore, uh, it was most my question as I have. Yes. No, but uh, as I said here, we have not this, uh, specifically been looking at that. We are aware of that these type of things are happening and uh, uh, we have noticed and uh, we, we are looking at uh, batteries. So together with uh, Revolt, uh, we are going, the, the daughter company of Northvolt are doing the recycling. We will be looking at quite a lot of uh, batteries coming back, that is from hybrid vehicles. They got 10,000 tons of batteries back last year. So it's uh, quite a lot to test on, and most of them are in the range of 10 to 12 kilowatt. Uh, so we, we will take a bit look at that. And what we can say is also you have some things when you are trying to uh, reuse batteries and so on that uh, batteries are dynamic. Uh, when you discharge uh, and you think it's totally discharged, then uh, within half a day it will be <laughs> quite high charge again <laughs> because the chemistry is. Um, is behaving, so to say, they, they are, uh, they, they, they are like uh, what called diffusing uh, the ions and so on. So uh, it, it is a lot of things and mechanical stress as such, they are trying to fix this mechanical stress and take into, into consideration when they develop these type of batteries. So um, they are trying to handle it, uh, the, the suppliers, but um, of course there is a problem uh, or could be. Joachim has a question. Yeah, I have a question uh, related to recycling of batteries. Uh, is it uh, for sure that the second life of the battery is the best uh, instead of recycling them from the beginning or immediately? Put it this way that uh, it depends on application and status of the battery. Some of these batteries has been uh, or have been used not too harsh. And when it comes to position, you could say that it could be that you just want to use this for another three years or another six years for the same application. You can always discuss is that second life battery or is it first life battery? Uh, but that, that is one of the alternatives. But then uh, if you have a business contract, you are leasing a car, a vehicle, and then if you want to make a new lease, you want to be sure that this will uh, last uh, during the, 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 the next period and so on. So those type of things are also included in, in uh, this project. Mm. So yeah. when it comes to recycling, if we come to a certain position, it's bad enough, then it's no reason to, to use it anymore. But if you still have, quite a good, um, if we look at uh, this, we, we could guess that perhaps what is coming back for recycling, like five, ten percent may be useful to go for the second life before you recycle it. But most of it probably goes directly to recycling. And also there are some statistic, recent uh, statistic in one of the study shows that uh, before recycling the you can um, make a second life and uh, use it in a second life application around uh, five to six years uh, without any problem. So it's uh, again depends on a lot of factors as Eric mentioned just now. Um, so it's nothing yes or no, <laughs> it's no. <nyaw. laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a kind of opportunity. To, yeah, but it's also opportunity to provide more extended service and value to your customer depends on where you are in the value chain the battery becomes an opportunity to provide a continuous services to the customer so in this way uh, i think for oems it's a very interesting model uh, uh, the second life any other question from the audience Yes, I'm I want back to. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I feel that this is is um, standardization, and also this talks, uh, this points in a direction for battery swapping. In in when I hear this, because 
if you have uh, easy access to swap the battery, uh, let's say in a car, then it must be much easier to replace it and, and then have a second life and, and a standardization coming from there with battery management systems and so on. We, we can say when it comes to battery swapping in China, it is quite uh, common, uh, especially in buses. They have 400,000 electrical vehicles uh, in the form of buses in China, 400,000. And they are mostly using swapping. So they have, uh, while, you, while we are having uh, the luggage, they have the batteries <laughs> in these buses. Uh, uh, but then you need to have, <laughs> this business model has becomes a bit tricky because um, if someone is owning all the batteries, then it's a simple business model. But if you have different um, people owning the batteries, uh, how, how do you handle that some of the batteries have a better stage uh, or better status than the others? So uh, it, it's more from those perspectives uh, that is causing the problem with the swapping, I would say. And also, it's, uh, it depends on what is your motivation, uh, what is the value you want to create, or you want to make a fast charging and uh, very quick to the customer, then uh, maybe the second life as a swapping is not good. But if you think other dimensions that will come into play, then the, you can use the second life batteries for swapping. So there are different things you need to, need to be considered. Again, it I comes think back the discussion to... around uh, standardization is really interesting because that will be one of the hurdles. Uh, today, the packs, each pack is individual. If you look into different OEMs, if you look into the modules, they are different and you need communication to work with them in all cases. So, so if you want to do this on a bigger scale, how should you do that? May, may I say, from our perspective, it feels a bit that the standardization uh, has to be driven to some extent from those who are using the batteries or uh, or the OEMs, because uh, if you have a number of OEMs and uh, they want to have some kind of a common standard, then the university can help doing this. But if the business uh, vendors say that no, we we don't want, we want to have our solution we have very little possibility to influence. So it's in some way, it is those are active in the field as OEMs. Uh, if they are pushing this, then it will be a standardization. Sooner or later it will be, uh, surely. And we, we can see this uh, when it comes to the charging, uh, how then uh, you have the, the um, Volvo trucks and uh, you have uh, Daimler trucks and you have the Tracton group with Scania and MAN and, uh, and Volkswagen trucks. They are working together on having some kind of a, at least not perhaps total standardization, but at least common understanding of uh, how, how should we be able to, to utilize the same charging stations, both for electrical charging and for hydrogen and so on. So. Uh, I, I think you are right. Uh, standardization is needed. The question is, <laughs> you, you, you need to have some kind of push from the vendors so that they are uh, saving money on it. And then uh, we as researchers, we can help on defining it, but uh, we have a bit difficulty to drive it. <laughs> I think we had a question from Joachim as well. Or did you get your answer, Joachim? Yes, I got my answer and uh, I like the answer. So I, I just g g gave my thumbs up. So it was good, good. Perfect. I have a, I have a question here. Uh, I was thinking about the design guidelines that you talked about. How close would you say the, the uh, designers and OEMs and companies designing these battery packs, how close are they working and, and, and practicing the, uh, these guidelines, or is it a long way to, to change design behavior and, and methods and processes, or, or are, we, are we close in, in real world right now? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, to be frank, I think it should be, uh, at least uh, the, the impression we got, uh, it's a long way to go uh, mm -hmm. on this aspect. And currently, we are making a more interview study more in detail uh, to know where they are. And uh, if they not even have a clue how to address then what is their strategy? So the thesis work is going on. Um, so maybe that will give a more better picture. 
um, uh-huh. but it, it's very difficult to say uh, like uh, comparing uh, make a statement at OEM level uh, because uh, this is only a mini part in the project but we uh-huh. don't really uh-huh. study a lot of companies how they work with the design and uh, with the battery so it's a very early stage uh, but uh, from our impression when we are discussing this there are a lot of things come up should we consider this at a vehicle level should we consider at a battery level or should we consider both or should we consider the application perspective or uh, yeah so there are things it seems like it's a lot of things uh, need to be cleared uh, in this so it's a, for me it's a long way at least Another question that popped up here uh, from my side is is when you look, you talked about the business models and, and the extend uh, category of the share of the loop. Can you see a trend that, that, that right now the business or the whole business community is moving towards any of these direction or is it still unclear where which one of these that would be more dominant than, than any other? Uh, maybe I can start, Eric, then you can compliment. Uh, mm-hmm. well, I think sharing uh, is something comes as a more dominant. Uh, but then when any company like OEMs or other, if you want to own the battery uh, and then take a responsibility to do something with the battery, then it's a sharing business model is dominant. Mm-hmm. But if you don't want to have a ownership, um, then it becomes more extending business model because you try to support the customer as much as you can with extending. So it depends on what is your business strategy and should you focus on the batteries or should you just want to support the customer? So, um, but we see these two trends. And of course, uh, if you're a battery manufacturer or then you're more interested on the recycling closing. Um, so it uh, depends on who you are in the value chain. Uh, yeah. There are different business models, but sharing business model, I see something as a dominant, uh, will be dominant. But we, we are still in the beginning to some extent when it comes to this. So uh-huh, uh-huh. even uh, the same company who are saying that we, we want to go this direction, Five years from now, it may be that they have been switching depending on how uh, things are, have developed. <laughs> so uh, we, we can see this with swapping. Some companies are having swapping. And when you have, um, if you have a fast charger and you can do the fast charging in five or 10 minutes, then there is no reason for the swapping uh, from uh, the, the you, you can work with it. it. It doesn't matter 10 minutes. But if the batteries are destroyed by this fast charging so that uh, the, the, the life is going down, then it may be a different issue. Because if you're doing the swapping, you can charge with a much lower C rate, as we've been talking about here. Uh-huh. So I, I would say that it depends very much on what will be the, uh, the quality of the batteries. How stable uh-huh. will the batteries be? How fast can you do the fast charging and those type of things? Uh, if you have a long charging time, then battery swapping is making a lot of sense. If you're very short, uh, you, you will have probably um, doing the fast charging and then swapping will just be something that is, uh, they will still keep it in China because they have built up a system for it. <laughs> okay. Good, thank you. Uh, right, so it's 12.25. So thank you guys for for really spending the time and thank you all that that uh, joined in and listened uh, i would say one last thing uh, from from you guys is is yeah, yeah, we looked at the model with the four quadrants what would you say is the the most in general the most important step here we had some voices saying standardization needs to be focused on talking about building up the the ecosystem what would you say is the what steps needs to be taken kind of right now or or in, within the next half year or something, where, where do we need to go now to, to move this forward? Because it's a lot of unknowns. We can hear that. So what do you recommend? What what's the the what would you send with the the audience here? Okay. That's a uh, yeah, Eric. I, I, I can say I, I agree. If we can get a standardization in uh, at least on uh, the the major things, uh, what levels should we have? What voltage should we have? What current? 
uh, for this with the charging, have a common charging infrastructure, those type of things. It makes a lot of sense because everyone will gain on that. But uh, the, the question then, the vendors need to be uh, interested in driving this. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I heard something that even Tesla has started letting others come into their stations. Uh, if you can get it like that, so that you can use all the charging station. If we can get that and standardization, we were talking about, someone was talking about, if we are remanufacturing, uh, if we take a battery pack, you can't just use it straight away today because uh, you have to reconfigure and do other type of things. If we can have some kind of standardization, how to build modules, then it would be much simpler. Mm. And uh, so you, you can have standardization in different ways. But uh, of course, it makes a lot of sense if you can have some kind of a standardization. Great. And Kotsas, where are you? Yeah, uh, for me, uh, build on that, uh, this uh, partnerships and ecosystems, uh, how you find uh, relevant stakeholders. And uh, I think that becomes uh, another important uh, step. Great. So thank you very much, Kodesvan and Eric, for for sharing with us. And thank you all that listened. Uh, OK, thank you. So, <laughs> so thank you. And by this, I would say goodbye. And, and thank you all for participating. Of course, this will be it's recorded and you can it will be uploaded to our web page and, and you can look at the previous webinars as well. So I really recommend to do this if you're interest, interested in the topic of of electromobility. So thank you very much for today and uh, thank you. take care. Bye-bye.